This episode of Eat the Rules is brought to you by You on Fire. You on Fire is the online group coaching program that I run that gives you a step-by-step way of building up your self-worth beyond your appearance. With personalized coaching from me, incredible community support, and lifetime access to the program so that you can get free from body shame and live life on your own terms. Get details on what's included and sign up for the next cycle at summerinandin.com forward slash you on fire. I'd love to have you in that group. This is Eat the Rules, a podcast about body image, self-worth, anti-dieting and intersectional feminism. I am your host, Summer Inanin, a professionally trained coach specializing in body image, self-worth, and confidence, and the best-selling author of Body Image Remix. If you're ready to break free of societal standards and stop living behind the number on your scale, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to the show. This is episode 190, and I am interviewing Louise Adams, clinical psychologist and host of the podcast, All Fired Up. We talk about how beauty ideals have always been torturing women and how they've evolved into harmful fitspo. We also deep dive into Louise's investigation into the Obesity Collective which is an organization in Australia, but has similar organizations in every country. And we talk about its ties to the weight loss drug manufacturer Novo Nordisk. And it's a super interesting story. I can't even really summarize it. She goes into detail, but it's just fascinating. You can find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode at summerinandin.com forward slash 190. First, I want to give a shout out to Pajuna, who left this awesome review. I've struggled with my weight and body image for years. I started therapy in August and shortly after discovered the podcast Dietitians Unplugged. Summer was a guest on one of their episodes, and I have been a listener of her podcast ever since. I listen to the podcast during my drive to school, and it never fails to amaze me Amaze me how much better I feel afterwards. I've still got a lot of body image work to do, but this podcast is super helpful. Thank you so much, Pajuna, for that amazing review. Before we get into it, know that you can leave a review by going to iTunes, search for Eat the Rules, and click Ratings and Reviews, and click to leave a review. And you can also help the show by subscribing via whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts, whether that's Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or Apple Podcasts. And then big announcement, I have a brand new newly updated 10 day body confidence makeover. So even if you had the previous one, check out the brand new updated version, you can find that at summer forward slash freebies with 10 steps to take right now to feel better in your body. This one really goes into some of the different ways of thinking about doing body image work and some things to really think in mind, keep in mind as you are doing this work. And I'm really excited to release this to the world. So If uh, you're listening to this episode, it is, I'm recording this on March 9th, but this is going to go live the week after. But anyways, it's live now. It's live as of March 9th. So you can go and um, get your hands on that. And I'm super excited about that one. And even if you've done the other one before, you can still go and, and download this one. I am really excited to share this episode with you. We actually recorded this episode in October. But I kept it for a while because Louise was still working on the third part of her investigation into the Obesity Collective. And so I just want to put a trigger warning on this episode because the word obesity is used quite a bit. Normally, we don't use that word on this podcast because it's stigmatizing language that's based on the useless BMI, um, which is also racist uh, or has racist roots to it which you can learn more about in the episode I did with Natasha Nagindi. But um, I'm just putting a trigger warning because that's the name of the organization. So uh, she does refer to it quite a bit in here. And please know that if you are sensitive to that word, then just, you know, just stop listening after the first 20 minutes of this podcast, because that's when she gets into that investigation that she's done. But it is truly fascinating what she's what she's dug into here. And uh, the Obesity Collective is essentially an organization in Australia that came out saying, kind of co-opting the language of, of health at every size in a way of or just speaking against like weight stigma. And yet, when she dug into the organization, she found that it, 
its connection to Novo Nordisk, which is which manufactures a weight loss drug. She's in two really, really, really in depth podcast episodes on it. Her podcast, All Fired Up, episodes episodes 55 and 66. And she's got a third one coming out uh, very soon, which she kind of gave me a teaser on what she talks about in there. And it's like, will blow your mind. But anyways, it's really fascinating. I was like, my jaw was on my desk the whole time we were chatting in this episode because I just couldn't believe it. Um, we kick off the episode talking about beauty ideals and 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 her thoughts on kind of Fitzbo because she had a, uh, a reporter ask her, her for her feelings on that. And she shares what she got from that. And then the second half of this episode is really diving into her investigation. So I hope you enjoyed as much as I, I enjoyed listening to her. Louise Adams is a clinical psychologist and the founder of Untrapped, an online program and community for people looking to liberate themselves from the prison of diet culture. She is the host of the anti-diet podcast, All Fired Up, and has extensive experience speaking to the media about the injustice of diet culture. She is the vice president of Hayes Australia and has written two books, The Non-Diet Approach Guidebook for Psychologists and Counselors, uh, which is a professional manual as well as her second book, Mindful Moments, which teaches people how to apply self-compassion-based mindfulness techniques in their everyday lives. Louise is determined to making a difference in changing our society's perception of dieting, weight loss, and body image. Let's get started with the show. Hello, Louise. Welcome to the show. Hello, Summer. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. As I said to you, when we corresponded, I feel like we're kindred spirits in a way because we both bring a certain type of rebellious fuck that energy to our work. And maybe I'm complimenting myself here. (laughs) (laughs) Because I just, I love the way you write things. Outrage sisters. And I'm so excited that we can share like the, the sense of rage. Yeah, exactly. So before we get into all the things I want to talk to you about, I'd love to just know, you know, what, what brought you in, into this work? What, you know, what was your relationship with, with food and your body like that brought you here? Oh, well, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> but when I went into private practice uh, in the early 2000s, like basically before I opened my private practice, for some reason, I decided that I needed to lose X amount of kilos before I could start. Isn't that like I look back now and go, what the hell? How weird is that? But I dutifully did uh, Jenny Craig. Thank you, Jenny. Lost X amount of kilos, immediately put them back on, like almost before I opened. (laughs) Uh, And that was a clue. When I opened the practice, everybody that I was seeing wanted to lose weight, hated their body or had an eating disorder. Uh, And that's kind of what got me started because I I was thinking, you know, I know how to help people with eating disorders being a clinical psych, but I didn't get any training at uni about how um, how to lose weight safely and and sort of not have that rebound Um, and also not have, uh, you know, I was thinking even then I was like, you can't tell people with eating disorders to lose weight. (laughs) Like this is crazy. Anyway, so that got me started on let's look at the evidence for the, you know, um, weight loss and keeping it off and not doing harm. And I sort of spent months down this rabbit hole of reading and researching and finding out that basically nothing works. <laughs> the, the whole weight science literature knows this. Uh, also, that there's a huge relationship between weight loss pursuit and development of disordered eating, upholding of uh, negative body image, Uh, And just just a range of of horrible things. So, and I was piecing that together, of course, with my own story and thinking, uh, well, I I can't ethically help people lose weight, but what do I do? And then I found this book called If Not Dieting, Then What by Dr. Rick Korsman, who is an Aussie GP, and he wrote the first anti-diet book um, here in Australia that I came across. And I got so excited because finally this non-diet approach made sense to me, like from an ethical perspective and a scientific perspective, because he was saying the same thing. You know, the weight science is telling us uh, that permanent weight loss just doesn't happen for the vast uh, amount of people and it's doing harm. And here's an approach that we can use with people that's psychologically safe as well as like really beautifully effective. So I jumped on a plane. I went to see uh, Dr. Rick and we became friends. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I just insisted. And um, and that's when, you know, from him I found 
the Hayes community and I found Dr. Lindo Bacon and like and fell, you know, basically madly in love with the whole anti-diet Hayes approach because in, you know, it's just, it just makes sense ethically as well as scientifically. So that's how I started and, and really I haven't I haven't looked back. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. And, and I, um, you're very, you know, like research focused and, and clearly like you're really good at digging into things as we'll sort of talk about later and some of the stuff that you've been digging into lately. But, um, I love that you, you were able to do that and really see that it, you know, it's, it's not just, uh, kind of this thing on a meme that you've seen that says diets don't work. It's like, no diets, don't, like there's no scientific evidence. <laughs> like you've 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 gone through it, which is really really important. The to evidence. Understand. I mean, we have so much evidence that it doesn't work. Like it's almost you know how people talk all the time about the evidence for climate change. Mm-hmm. Like that's how I feel where we're at. Like we have so much evidence, yeah. and yet we're still using coal. What the hell's going on? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And we're gonna we'll we'll segue. We're gonna put a pin in that kind of what the hell is going on because you've been digging into some stuff of what the hell is going on (laughs) because I want to talk to you about something first just that you you had mentioned to me before and just how this week a journalist reached out to you to comment on Instagram fitness influencers which by the way I sort of find it I mean maybe what kind of comment did they want from you like a one about how it's harmful or do they want you to support it I don't know you can tell me but I anyways yeah just to tell me tell me tell me what where where that sent you once you got that email Oh yeah I mean I I think now journalists kind of know where I'm coming from which is nice <laughs> um, <laughs> It should but, be loud and clear um, <laughs> Yeah yeah but the the question was something like look um fitness influences now seem to be a little more body positive and like less blatantly harmful than they used to be. Uh, you know, what do you think of this encouraging trend? <laughs> and like, I stay away from fitness Instagram just because I don't want to lose my mind with rage every time I look at Instagram. So, you know, my bubble is very haze, body positive, you know, it's it's pretty cool. But she had sent me some uh, of these inspirational fitness influences, so I had to look at their accounts to 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 see what was going on. Ah, oh, like I can feel the rage already again. <laughs> And it's only six in the morning where you are. <laughs> Start your day with some, a nice cup of rage. <laughs> oh, it's going well with my peppermint tea. So it's okay. <laughs> but what I'm seeing is these, uh, I mean, it, there's no change. Basically, they're still uh, very thin, extremely tanned. All of them are in bikinis for some reason, because that's how we do fitness, right? Always in a bikini. And But what I noticed about the, I mean, apart from just the what I've sent back to the journal is like nothing has changed. Like if 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 even these women who fit the thin ideal completely, but what they're talking about is, oh look, I have a little bit of cellulite on my on my ass, or you know, I, if I if I'm bending over, I've got like a tummy roll, or I'm going to take a photo of myself bloated, you know, because I've just eaten something. That's revolutionary, and I'm like. That is not revolutionary. That is that is a thin person almost co-opting body positivity, and uh, and and to praise it, it's just not it's not good enough. It's not good enough, you know. And and uh, but one thing that really caught my eye, uh, a facet, because I haven't been there for so long, because perhaps because I'm just really old now, in my late forties, but. You know, the body image ideal has always been there, you know, torturing women for as long, as far back as you can remember. And and the specific body ideals change, you know, according to the the time. And when I when I was young, <laughs> back last century, in, in the 90s, it was all the supermodels and, you know, people like Cindy Crawford or Naomi Campbell, like these really tall, quite athletic massive boobs you know they they're in the um just too funky for me george michael video very you know yes amazing women (laughs) remember that and i remember being like a really scrawny teenager with a spiral perm looking at them going oh you know and that was a start not one of the many starts of me not liking my body and feeling inadequate um but we've morphed from there after that came the heroin chic of kate moss and Mm -hmm. and then 
What happened after that? I think just just years and years of really boring fitspo. But what I saw on these fitness influencers accounts is like this kind of very odd for me looking Kim Kardashian style, uh, enormous butts, tiny, tiny waist, really, really suntanned, extremely made up and, and the lip fillers. And I'm just like, my mind is just being blown by these butts, these bubble butts on these white women. I'm like, who even has this? <laughs> this I mean, the, the shapes are always unattainable and this is the current one. But there's something about this bubble butt that just really outrages me uh, because I, I seriously think that this look is, is it perhaps the most expensive look that we've been asked to go after? Like how much money and time are we supposed to spend trying to look like that? Because to be honest, I think that look is only attainable by surgery and uh, uh, that really fires me up. I mean, we are in apparently the third wave of feminism, but women are still being, uh, you know, there's a pay gap, but we're still not paid as much as men. And like a, a significant amount of our income, I think, is supposed to be devoted to trying to look like stuff like this on Instagram. And I, for one, I, I've had a gut full of this it's it, it, unbelievable uh, standard. And I, I don't want this. I've got two girls. I don't want them to look and say, oh, that's fitness. That's inspo. Uh, that is that is not. This is some kind of uh, uh, Frankenstonian body ideal that, that I don't want to play. <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> And it's always changing. I mean, it's never, it's never static, as you, as you said, you know, it's, it was, it was one look and then another, and now it's this. And it's like, what, what's next? Like robot arms, probably, or something. But. What is next? What is next? We look like blow up dolls. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it's so hard, right? Because it just, it, you know, from a social and political perspective, it just, it, it, the, the machine, like the beauty industry and the diet industry profit off of, are unworthy, you know, this feeling of unworthiness and this desire to fit in in the fitness industry, like these fitness influencers are profiting off of, you know, making us feel less than, you yeah. know, even, but, but this, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the gaslighting of that by these fitness influencers saying, hey, hashtag being real on Instagram, like, hey, don't be, don't be ashamed of your body if you're not perfect. Like after they spent thousands of dollars looking perfect. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, like, how do you, just out of curiosity, how do you protect your kids from that? Because they're probably at an age, well, maybe they don't have social media yet, because there's, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, everyone, every parent is different in terms of when they open those floodgates for their kids. But um, how, how do you sort of speak to your kids about that? Yeah. Um, in the entranceway to our house, we have the Nalgona body positivity poster. <laughs> And like my kids have been raised on body positivity because I found this whole movement luckily before I had kids, but they live in diet culture and it's tricky. So inside our house is like a haze bubble, and and I've, I've been reinforcing messages since they were since they could talk uh, and modelling stuff. But yes, the social media thing. So I've got a thirteen year old. She's on social media, but my eight year old, my nine year old now, sorry, is on like she plays little games and stuff. So they're, they're, they're definitely influenced by all of these messages. But I'm, I'm really proud of my eldest child in particular. They, um, they recently had like one of those PDHPE assignments where they had to talk about the influence of social media on kids and, and what kind of messages were coming out. And they had to pick something. And all of their friends were picking weight loss ads and, and talking about body positivity, which I think is great at, at 12 and 13 that they're picking that. My child picks The Bachelorette. <laughs> 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 and they, they talk about The Bachelorette being exclusively focused on heterosexual relationships and how um, exclusionary that is to people uh, in the gay and lesbian or LGBTQI community, also yeah. how racist it is, how ableist it is. And and she, uh, sorry, they ended up saying, so they had to create a poster to, to do an alternative to the Bachelorette poster. And their poster was Love is Love, 100% of us deserve love. 
instead of, you know, this exclusionary message of love is only for heterosexual, good-looking people with plastic surgery. So I was so proud of them. Oh, that's great. Yeah, because they live in this culture as well, but they are pushing back. That's awesome. That's so good to hear. Yeah, the the bachelor and the bachelorette. I mean, talk about like beauty ideals. It's like it's like you if you don't fit that, I'm they probably take their measurements and everything before they come on the show. They have to look a certain way. But you yeah. literally get them confused. It's like who who which which brunette was that? Which blonde was that? I don't know. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So how did you leave it with that journalist? I have sent back like a whole stack of uh, much more radical, inclusive people from around the, the globe who are doing promoting movement because I don't. I agree with what you said. I don't think there's such thing as fitness inspo based on what a body looks like. You know, I think anything that glorifies one particular body or, or repeats one particular body that's not inspirational. That's um, brainwashing. So, but I think all accounts need to display diversity and, uh, and remind us that, you know, if you, if you want to move your body, it's not because of what we look like, which it's hard to get that on a visual medium like Insta, but there's lots of accounts that are getting there and saying stuff that are really, truly, genuinely awesome from people who don't look like um, these uh, surgeried people. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that um, there's more every day, which is nice, you know, so I hope that that kind of tips the balance, hopefully in our lifetime <laughs> towards more yeah, <laughs> truly so. inclusive accounts and specifically as it relates to fitness and movement and ones that really speak to speak to it from um, the perspective of like, you know, move your body because it feels good, not in order to not in order to look a certain way or, you know, like tone your butt or whatever uh, it is, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I've sometimes seen like, you know, I'll go on the what's new feed of Instagram or whatever, the one where it just shows you stuff that you don't follow. And yeah, the odd, yeah, the odd time I'll see stuff like that. And I'm like, this is not fitness. <laughs> What is this? <laughs> this is, this is Madame, Madame Tussauds Waxworks. This is not fitness. <laughs> yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. But um, what it did highlight for me as well is, you know, because in my Hayes anti-diet diversity bubble on social media, there's, there's heaps of stuff that I follow. But what this journal was asking for is where are the Australian body diverse fitness accounts and with big followings? And it's true. There's, there's very little. So, uh, this is a call out. <laughs> any any Aussie um, body positive anti diet uh, fitness type people get on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. We almost... need to fight back with more visibility. Yeah, yeah, that that is very true. The ones I know are all based in North America for the most part. I think. Yeah, Canada, yeah, Canada yeah. And, and the US. So. Yeah, there, there's got to be, there's got to be someone, create it, build it, <laughs> find somebody. <laughs> yeah, come on, Aussies, we've got nothing else to do at the moment. Let's get, let's get creating these accounts. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's dive into something that you've been working extend, it sounds like extensively on the mixed stigma. Is oh, that, yeah. was that what you're calling it? The mixed stigma project or? What? Um, well, look, yeah, I, um, you know, I do a podcast and last year, this all, uh, I started on, I put out a podcast called uh, Inside the Obesity Collective. I hate using that word. I apologize for using this word, but trigger warning from now on, I might use the O word a lot because I'm talking about the obesity organizations that are here in Australia. So me and my um, guest, Mandy Lee Noble, who's an anti-diet dietitian, we put out this podcast on what's going on uh, at the Obesity Collective, which is an Aussie uh, obesity organisation, which is claiming kind of claiming to care a lot about things like weight stigma and, and how people in larger bodies are treated in Australia and about, you know, changing things. But What we actually found and what we were talking about in the podcast is that a lot of the stuff happening at the moment with the Obesity Collective and with other Aussie obesity organisations is these incredibly intricate ties back to big pharma, specifically Novo Nordisk, who obviously have just arrived here in Australia and had their weight loss drug, Saxenda, approved. So 
basically, you know, the the gist is that Novo, Nordisk are busily handing out money to any organisation that will listen uh, to push this agenda, really, with no, no other word for it, that Novo have. And Novo have this idea that they want to get into Australia, they want to get obesity declared as a disease because, you know, the obvious dots to connect there is that if obesity is uh, declared a disease here in Australia, that opens the door to get weight loss drugs and surgery put on the public health purse, meaning that their profits will obviously increase. So, I mean, this is a very unexpected rabbit hole for me, honestly. (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah, but um, what what we've uncovered is one of the methods that they're using to kind of, I guess, you know, we were just talking about how in Insta influencers kind of gaslight us a bit and mask by like using the language of body positivity to sell us the same old thing, which is like an unattainable body ideal. These obesity organisations here in Australia are using the language of let's combat weight stigma in order to cover up this massive agenda from Novo Nordis to sell uh, weight loss drugs here in Australia by getting everything uh, declared as a disease. So like we've really noticed here in Australia, because what we used to hear in the media and all over the place was like war on obesity and tackle obesity and obesity is bad and, you know, fat people are crushing the health system and all this sort of hysterical rhetoric. <laughs> and it's really changed in the last couple of years to be weight stigma is terrible, you know, it's, it's not large people's fault that they're large, but it's, you know, it's really terrible. But the reason weight stigma is terrible is that it stops people getting, quote, unquote, treatment for their fatness. Oh, no. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, I've actually, I'm looking right now at a PowerPoint slide that Novo Nordisk presented to the Obesity Collective back in 20, I can't remember, 2018 maybe, It's saying we are committed to this in the long term. Let's create legitimacy and urgency for the medical management of obesity. And then they've got this series of dot points. Their ambition is to reduce stigma associated with obesity in order to increase the amount of what they call medical management. So it's all written there. And that's why I'm calling it McStigma because (laughs) it's like, you know, the McDonald's franchises just sort of pop up. Yes. All over the place, selling the same thing, same burger. Here in Australia, the Obesity Collective popped up selling the McStigma version because it's also, you know, it's it's fast stigma. It's not it's right. not genuine. But there's other organizations that are suddenly popping up too. We have this thing called the Weight Issues Network, which is which the Obesity Collective funded. And this is a patient, patient group. <laughs> of uh, people suffering with the disease of obesity. That popped up late last year. And then another thing called NACOS, which is the National Association for the Clinical Obesity Services, that popped up. NACOS was entirely funded by Novo Nordisk. And guess what the agenda is for NACOS? To get obesity treated as a disease, to combat weight stigma. It's, It's the same formula popping up with all of these different organizations. So I'm pissed off with McStigma because I care deeply about weight stigma and I know that a lot of Hayes scholars and anti-diet people and people with you know who've genuinely been hurt by weight stigma also really care about it. But we don't care about it because we want better fucking access to weight loss drugs and surgery. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so I don't want to say it's shocking. Because it's not, it's but not right. but it's it's <laughs> enraging, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 so en- enraging. And um, you before we start, we before we hit the record button, you had said that 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 part of this was was Canada's fault, and so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I was like, wait a minute, everything's always the US's fault. What do you mean it's Canada's fault? <laughs> kidding, kidding. I right know. Now. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we have deep love for Canada, but <laughs> um, so I've put out two podcast episodes so far on this whole Novo Nordis connection with the obesity organizations in Australia. And but I've got another one coming because what I've uncovered now is that this is not just a local thing. Novo Nordisk are not just targeting Australia. They're targeting the globe. 
this is a global thing. They're doing this in Europe. They're doing this in England. They're doing it in the USA and they've done it already in Canada. So Canada's kind of like where your original McDonald's is, which is Obesity Canada. And Ronald McDonald is Dr. Arya Sharma, who is very well known in the obesity research world. And he he has this role and connection with Novo Nordisk where he flies around the world to conferences and uh, all kinds of places and he trains people, he trains the patient information groups on how to talk to the media about their disease and about weight stigma and about this urgent need for um, obesity to be a disease. So, and and like he came to Australia last year uh, on the, thanks thanks to like Nova Nordisk paying him, he came and he did a presentation to the Weight Issues Network, like this this patient group, and trained them in all those messages. And um, he did it in Europe as well. And in the European conference, he was talking to the um, participants there and he was talking about how he trained the Canadian patient group so well that no matter what questions a journalist might ask of these patients, the patients will answer by saying obesity is a disease, weight stigma is wrong, and like we basically need better treatments for obesity. So, you know, this is really like for me terrifying stuff for, for this uh, to be so calculated and so well funded by big pharma. Uh, and it's so clever to use well known researchers in the field who already have, you know, a lot of respect. Uh, but, but, you know, what is sort of happening is that obesity researchers are kind of becoming a giant marketing department for, for Novo Nordisk and no one realizes it. Wow. You've uncovered a lot. Like you, you, that's a lot of work to kind of go and follow each of those threads and look at, you know, who's funding what, but you've, you've put a lot, I'm assuming you've put a lot of time and energy into this. Yeah, I think I might have a little bit of OCD around it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really serious because in a, in a way, like to, to create some sort of parallel to it, it, it's almost like trying to sell conversion therapy as a solution to homophobia, like, a you know, which is obviously it's not the same thing here, but. I, I totally am on your page. Absolutely. Because um, we've had a little bit of kickback, pushback from uh, Obesity Collective, <laughs> And I'm so proud because just in September, they've actually put out a statement on their website about obesity and health at every size. So I feel like we're, our podcast has raised awareness to them to the point that they have uh, had to put out a public statement about uh, health at every size. So we are a squeaky wheel, which is good. But yeah, and in that statement, they're saying, look, health at every size and the obesity collective, we're pretty much on the same page. And um, no, no, because exactly what you're talking about, like that's like the the gay conversion therapy. The way I think about it is like uh, what they're saying is, hey, you know, we are the coal industry and we're really on the same page as Greenpeace because we both care about the environment. (laughs) Right, right. Like when we define care, (laughs) we have a very different uh, approach, you know, raping and pillaging the landscape, which is kind of what, Uh, obesity collective we're all about and preserving the environment and working with um, eco-diversity which is what Hayes are all about so yeah it's um it's maddening to see this happening and to see it happening on such a a global level that's why I'm really trying to raise awareness of it and and get get us all like to digest our media really suspiciously when it comes to who's funding it (laughs) um which we never hear. You know, we, when we read a journal article, for example, we will see the conflicts of interest. They have to be reported. And that happened because industry industry money was dirtying research so much. And so we, we now can read a journal article and see uh, who's, you know, whose perspective is influencing the conclusions. But when we look at the media, like when we just watch the news and we see you know, an obesity researcher talking about how awful weight stigma is. We don't know that that person's actually, you know, had like $50,000 from Novo Nordisk in their, in their bank account. 
because there's no request or requirement for that disclosure to happen. And that's that's really awful because then like how we start to understand this narrative is influenced by big pharma money without us even knowing. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, big pharma has its hands in, in so many different like, you know, industries and places and things like that. It's like David and Goliath. Like it's, you know, it's, it is. Yeah, it's a. You're like you're you're like Aaron Brockovich. Over there. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's totally a, the same. That's a, that's a compliment. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, like, what are you? Because you tried, I you tried to re- like connect with some of these people, like you, and then they sort of ghosted you. Is that right? Like, from <laughs> what I understand. Uh huh. Yeah, I think they decided they offered us coffee, like let's meet for coffee, and then they kind of decided they didn't want to meet us for coffee. And then I think instead they just started putting up things on their website about without giving us the opportunity to um, define who we are, <laughs> to say who we are. Yeah, so what to do about it is is the question. And engaging in conversation with people like this, the problem that happens is that they're so big and they're so kind of, bought into this that I don't think I don't think there's mer- um, a point <laughs> in um, I don't think much change will be achieved because you know that it'll be token right anything will be token uh, and twisted so instead what we've got to do is create really strong alternatives to industry funded places and that's um, and they're threatened by the Hayes community clearly because like in this um statement they say, Oh, you'll love this. Health at every size is a weight inclusive and weight neutral approach predominantly provided through private consultations with healthcare professionals or commercial programs. So it's trying to minimize who Hayes are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's looking at it like a, a privately th- private thing versus like a movement or a, you know, a, exactly. like a paradigm. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we are a social justice paradigm, but you've left out all of the researchers, the, the enormous amount of scholars. The, the international groups like ASDA uh, and NAFA and Hayes Australia and like if they're, they're really trying to present this is just private practice people trying to make money out of a different approach to weight management, which is a stunning misdirection of what uh, a social justice movement is all about. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, just to people listening or, you know, other practitioners, it's like what, what? what do we, what do we do? You know, like, I guess it's, is it worth knocking on these doors or I guess you're kind of saying like, yeah, know, I think the more we scream, like they're listening. The second episode I put out was, um, <laughs> obesity Australia, if you are listening, <laughs> because <laughs> clearly they are. <laughs> so keep being a squeaky wheel. Keep, um, like if you go to a, if you're a, a clinician or a researcher and you're at a conference, stand up and say, I represent Hayes and I disagree with what you're doing. Uh, or stand up and um, write letters to the editor. We just had this thing put out in um, Nature Journal, which is called a Joint International Consensus on Obesity Stigma, which, and it had 40 authors around the world. So it looks like, oh my goodness, we've got this amazing collaborative statement on on weight stigma and how to push back against it from all of these international researchers, except that the entire thing was funded by Novo Nordisk and half of, and so, so they paid for the article to be done. They paid for the authors to be flown to various parts of the world to have quote unquote meetings about the paper. And on top of that, half of the researchers in the paper have other arrangements with Novo Nordisk through speaker fees and consultation fees and things like that. So this thing that looks like a joint international consensus statement is a giant marketing strategy as well. So we need to write letters to the editor of the journal to say, you know, when a conflicts of interest statement is almost longer than the paper itself, why is it allowed to be in the journal? Why isn't it under a heading that says infomercial? Wow. (laughs) So this is what I'm suggesting we have to do. We have to do activism. We have to kind of like write letters to the editor, stand up at conferences, like even when I'm seeing clients. So I saw a client a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about being recommended a weight loss drug. And so I I was 
letting her know that you can find out if your GP or physician has been funded or gotten money from uh, pharmaceutical because you can do that here in Australia. You can just do a search term and find out. And in that case, her physician had been paid close to $10,000 to, to, to push this weight loss drug. And, um, and, and so it's, it's information is power. If we can understand this, if we can ask for more transparency from our healthcare providers, we can make better decisions, you know, and I'm not saying, okay, you can never choose weight loss, drugs or surgery. If that's your groove, that's your groove, but know where your information is coming from and, you know, be a bit more critical about like whose interests are really being served when, when you're getting a recommendation. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, cause it, all this stuff kind of gets um, cherry picked and headlines get put into mainstream media or um, even just, you know, from like a doctor's perspective, if they're sitting down with a pharmaceutical, like they're getting their information from the pharmaceutical salesperson and whatnot. And I think we have to be really um, critical of it. And, and like you said, ask the questions and, and, and try to advocate for ourselves and find health practitioners that are operating from, a more health at every size standpoint, not being funded by their local pharmaceutical salesperson. I know, I know. Yeah, so we've got to kind of, um, we've got to band together. We've got to get critical. So if you're if a, a health professional or lived experience, join groups and form groups because that's what the other side are doing. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, join ASDA, join NAFA, join Hayes Australia, join Hayes UK you know, gather, we need like a, a particular call out is like fat activist groups in Australia and Europe. We need, we need kind of gathering <laughs> because uh, these patient networks are growing and they're being really well funded and media trained. So their agenda here in Australia with the Weight Issues Network is to become like leading voices of the, what they call the lived experience. And, um, mm-hmm. That that breaks my heart because it's so it, for people to stand up and say, look, I am a person with a chronic disease and I want more treatment for my chronic disease and for that to be the dominant uh, narrative for what it's like to live in a country in a larger body. You know, and it doesn't, they don't care, these weight stigma um, people don't care about human rights or, you know, you know, changing the sizes of, seats in public transport so that everyone fits or equal, you know better um, health care in terms of like not cutting off people from IVF treatment or adoptions because of body size. That's yeah. not the kind of weight stigma they care about. Their, their literal narrow definition of stigma is how much is this getting in the way of selling my um, weight loss products to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. It's stigma. I can see why you get up at 6am every day. <laughs> oh my god um no that's like that's a lot i mean i didn't mean to kind of pop in a joke there but it's a lot and i really i commend you on all the the work that you've done around it because wow i was i was like you know just going through your stuff and listening to your podcast and um just really impressed with the amount of time and energy you've put into this and just want to say thanks because uh you know not everyone would do that or you know and that clearly you really care and um, hopefully, hopefully some stuff comes out of it and hopefully, um, you know, this, this helps other people know about it as well, who, who didn't realize that this was going on. So yeah, I just want to thank you for all your time. As we wrap things up here, where can people find more of you? <laughs> Um, you can, well, at the moment I'm hiding under my doona in 2020, <laughs> just rocking in horror. So I haven't been as active this year, but um, untrapped.com.au uh, is the website. And then you can find me on Instagram, untrapped underscore au. And Twitter, look, I don't really understand it. So it's much better to find me on Insta and the website and on Facebook as well, which is uh, untrapped. Uh, but you know, you can also email me if you're fired up about something. If you've heard anything on the down low about Novo Nordisk and its outrageous tentacles reaching into your town or city, uh, Louise at untrapped.com.au. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, keep your eyes out on the next part three on All Fired Up. <laughs> 
it's coming. <laughs> yeah, as you said, there was going to be two more parts. So, oh yeah, there's going to be two more parts because one is the part about how it's global, and then part four is about the actual weight loss drugs themselves because that's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Don't uh, believe what you're told. They're not as effective as you think. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it would seem, it, yeah, like otherwise everyone would just be, I everyone know. would do that. And, you know, but it's <laughs> obviously, yeah, no, but they always create more problems in the long term. Well, thank you, Louise, so much. It's been such a pleasure. I really appreciate you. And I'm so glad we finally got to connect. Oh, thank you. It was so lovely to talk to you. Thanks, Summer. Rock on. Wow, all of that really blew my mind. I learned so much in this episode about what's really going on and all the work she's done. I can't believe how much investigation she's done into this. But it's it's really fascinating. And it's important for us to realize what's really happening when we see these messages from like these, you know, obesity, quote, unquote, organizations, and like, who's really funding them and what's really behind the scenes. And, you know, they come off as like caring about people and really, like, they're just trying to profit off of individuals individuals and like uphold the systems of harm in order to continue to profit off of these individuals. I would highly recommend listening to her podcast episodes on those if you're interested in it. Um, It's all fired up episode 55 and then 66. And then I know she's got another one coming up real soon. Um, And you can find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode at summerinandin.com forward slash 190. Thank you so much for being here today. Rock on. I'm Summer Inanin, and I want to thank you for listening today. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Summer Inanin. And if you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts, search Eat the Rules, and subscribe, rate, and review this show. I would be so grateful. Until next time, rock on.